and welcome to Start Right Here, a podcast where we discuss breaking in, standing out, and the path to success in the beauty industry. I'm your host, Corinne Corbett, and I hope the conversations I have with my guests inspire you to forge a path of your own. Let's get started. Today, I'm really excited to welcome a guest who is literally preparing the next generation of beauty industry leaders. I'm pleased to welcome today Melanie Moore, who is the Associate Chair of the Business of Beauty and Fragrance Program at the Savannah School of Art and Design, aka SCAD. And we're going to talk to her about her career journey, her switch into academia, and what it's like to prepare the next generation of industry leaders. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. So let's start. Can you give us your 30-second bio? I am the associate chair of the program, as you just mentioned. But before this, I was working at Estee Lauder Companies. Um, I was executive director of travel retail for Clinique and Lab Series, the brand, which was an awesome experience. I also have professional experience in spirits industry. I worked at Toys R Us for a while, and I started my career at Liz Claiborne in fashion and accessories. A little bit about me, I guess, as a kid, um, I'm an only child of two military parents, so I've moved all over. Um, I have a passion for modern dance, big foodie, and uh, love beauty. Oh, and Savannah is a good place to be if you're a foodie, too. Savannah is amazing for food, definitely. Was the beauty industry a destination or a detour for you? That's a great question. I would have to say that I really don't look at my career from an industry perspective. Like I didn't really focus on industry. So I always knew I wanted to teach. Like I knew that I would ultimately end up there. And, you know, even in high school, I would tutor. I tutored for 10 years with the Fresh Air Fund. So that's something I really enjoyed. But as I was building my tool pack, I knew that image-based industries was really what I wanted to focus on in marketing. So as I was gaining those skill sets, I ended up in beauty. And as soon as I got in, I knew like that was a fit for me. I had that passion. You know, I just loved it. I love that you said image-based, please, because from Liz Claiborne to beauty, even spirits, it is the image that is pulling you in to the experience, toys as well. So I see the connection there. How did you go about getting your first job and tell us a little bit about it? It's such a great question. I remember um, I went to Notre Dame undergrad and getting into fashion wasn't absolutely like a clear path. So coming from a school so traditional. So I did a lot of you know research on my own. I literally sent my resume in the mail, i.e. folded, put the stamp on it, send it in the mail to so many different companies. And I heard back from Liz Claiborne and I interviewed and I didn't get the job. So I was really disappointed because it was a rotational program. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, I heard back and they had me interview in a different department and I received a role and position in that rotational program. So that was the start to my career, which was really amazing. You know, what's interesting about that scenario, that's actually happened for me three out of the four jobs I've had in my career. And so I think it's very important that people realize that even though you're interviewing and you may not get a position immediately with that company, make sure you leave a great impression with them because, you know, they keep your information. They remember you and they come back. I'm impressed by the fact that they called you back and this has happened more than once for you and that you didn't lose heart. It's a difficult thing to know you're this close to a position or you think you are and then you don't get it. But to hear this story that there may be another opportunity down the line, if you make a great impression, is really important. It took me eight months to get into Estee Lauder. Woo, child. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about the rotational program and the skill sets you picked up there that you've kind of put in your toolkit and kept from then. I think what I really built there was relationships. And as you rotate through design and operations and sales and then, you know, business planning, 
you start to get to know a lot of people in the divisions, you know where they're held accountable, you understand what they're trying to accomplish. And I think that knowledge really helped me move up very quickly at Liz Claiborne. I would say that the big skills, one, analytical, I think technical skills was a big thing for me as well. But you know, at the end of the day, I think when I look at how I got promoted and how I was able to move things through, that's really relationships. It's so important. Great. And I agree about relationships because I am still connected with people from my first job to this day. So you've worked across fashion, liquor, spirits, toys. What are the similarities and differences between these industries and beauty and the kind of work you've done? They seem so different. And I hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, how do I get into this industry? And I always tell people, you shouldn't look at it as an industry. You should look at it as a function and a skill set that you bring to a brand or to a company. And as a marketer, you know, I realized early on that really only 50% of what you're selling is a product. That's only half of it. And I have a small little story because I remember when I first moved to New York, you know, I came from Florida and this was like the big city. I'm walking down in Times Square. I remember seeing this homeless guy and he has this box with a hole and uh, with an arrow pointing out and it says $1 to look in the hole. And crowd was starting to form. And I'm so curious, like, what is in this box? And I paid the dollar clearly, but it was then (laughs) that it clicked to me that he created a need and sold me a solution to my curiosity. And so what does that mean when I'm selling toys? What does that mean when I'm selling spirits? What does that mean when I'm selling a face cream? And it's all very similar. So I would say with toys, that was probably a little bit more challenging because you're kind of marketing to a child, but the parent is the purchaser. So there is a little bit of complexity there, but it was just so much fun. But overall, I think that you can apply those skills kind of across industries. So it is a matter of identifying a need. Or creating it. Or creating it. Interesting. And offering a solution or creating a solution. Absolutely. At the Estee companies, you held key positions in skincare and travel retail. Are there specific skills you need to employ with each of them? Because those roles are a little bit different. So let's talk about what you need to know and do for each. So I had two big roles at Estee Lauder. One was in global marketing and the other was travel retail. So I would say for global marketing, um, and I was focused on the Asia market. So traveled a lot, spent a lot of time in Asia. I don't think you necessarily have to be a brain surgeon to do well in marketing or to come up with the best products. I would liken that job to the U.S. Secretary of State. Looking at the the global world, understanding a global consumer, and then aligning everyone to one brand, one product launch, and one message, that is a very different job than I would say travel retail and understanding how to take a brand's message and adapt it all around the world in airports or in flight. So I think it's a very different skill set. I think travel retail is a little bit more commercial. There's a lot more men in travel retail than I would say in the global marketing area. It was very, very different. But I enjoyed both. I think travel retail for me, uh, you know, that division had really great leadership with Olivier Beautry, very diverse and very global and international. Lots of fun, lots of fun travel. But it's a very unique space. And I think it really challenges you to be a pretty resilient marketer. Oh, I think that's great. I don't know a lot about travel retail. So hearing just what the job is like is really interesting. But what I really found interesting in what you just said is the secretary of state analogy, which makes me think that cultural competency and cultural understanding is so important in that kind of a role. Asian markets, but all Asian markets are not created equal. So understanding what is important for each market then becomes an important part of the marketing plan. Did you learn by doing? Did you, what kind of crash course did you get? You know, I've traveled quite a bit. And so at Cornell, when I got my MBA, um, I spent the second year abroad. I went to Japan, Korea, China, South Africa, Turkey, Bulgaria. So I did a huge international kind of tour because I was focused on negotiations and emerging markets. So I did have that background and that helped tremendously. But I think overall, if you have empathy and you are not judging others by your standards or who you are or what you think, 
I think you will be successful in the role. I just think that empathy is really important into being successful and working globally. How often did you travel when you were doing this? And for how long were the trips? Just to give you an example, right before I left travel retail, I had been to seven countries in six weeks. How many suitcases did you carry? I have one small suitcase. I am like the most amazing packer. One, that's it. Little small carry-on fits above because my luggage never shows up. So I always take it on the flight. So I'm used to it. I'm a beauty junkie and I have not learned yet to uh, (laughs) carry less beauty. (laughs) Well, the good thing about working in beauty, typically when I get to those countries, there are beauty products there. So (laughs) I I got lucky. I find I have to pack a little bit more now that I'm not at at Estee Lauder. Let's talk about the switch to academia. How did that come about? You said earlier that, you know, you knew teaching was going to be your kind of end game. What made you make the switch? I definitely think that I was in a place in my career where I was open to exploring something new. I don't think I would have gone to another beauty company. I really love Lauder, but what was I two years into the executive director role and just really kind of exploring, like, what are my skill sets? What do I want to do? I probably had one more move before getting my PhD or going into academia. And what would that be? As soon as that thought entered my head, I got a message from SCAD and LinkedIn about this amazing opportunity to start a beauty program at the college level. And I was like, oh, wow, (laughs) that's just mixing the two together and combining two things that I really love. And it was just something that I couldn't turn down, you know, and I really feel like I found my calling. I can't tell you what it's like to wake up every day and to see your students and go to bed with this like huge sense of accomplishment because you know you're changing lives and you know you're doing something powerful. It's amazing. And I love it here. You know, despite the amazing restaurants in Savannah, SCAD is like Hogwarts. And I knew the first interview where we have to kind of give these like mini lectures, I was like, that's it. This is what I love to do. This is where I can really make a difference in the industry that I love and bringing new talent and changing the way that junior level people think and growing them throughout their career and connecting alumni with opportunities. Like this was really a passion for me and I love it. We have some amazing conversations at SCAD and I have a different role. So being at Estee Lauder for almost eight years, Only getting the Estee Lauder point of view is very different than being at the collegiate level and talking to every beauty company in the industry, holding conversations on every level of the industry, bringing them into the classroom, showing them how talented our students are. It's an amazing opportunity. It sounds amazing. And I wasn't even aware of SCAD's program until I met you. So it's really great to know that there are dedicated programs that are focused on the next generation of industry leaders, preparing them and expanding their minds so that they can innovate as they come into these roles. Start Right Here is brought to you by Beauty Biz Camp, where we equip and inspire the next generation of industry leaders. Head over to our website, beautybizcamp.com, for more information and sign up for our mailing list so you can stay in the know about our upcoming programming. I saw that you teach a course called the History of Beauty. Yes, the Beauty Through the Ages. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of cultural appropriation happening by fashion brands, mostly in beauty bins. And I've always said, this is the course we need. Tell me about what you teach in that course and the importance of it, because I think it is critically important that anybody entering these industries, both fashion and beauty, understand the role that beauty plays in the entire like appearance industry. And I love how it was designed because it is the foundation. It's the first course that you have to take when you start the major. And in doing our research and preparing this class, we had a few objectives. One was to give the students a foundation, um, seeing what products and how we perceive beauty throughout the ages. So we look at everything from Egyptian era all the way up till today. And then we talk about what's coming in the future. The second thing that we do is we look at 
people who have really grown what we call the consumerism of beauty. So we've looked at kind of the Elizabeth Ardens, the Estee Lauders, the Madam C.J. Walkers, and we've gone all over the world and kind of talked about what was happening in Japan or what's happening in South America, what's happening in Europe at this time. And so we look at it across category. So the students have workshops where they actually get to experience every single category in beauty and play just to gain that affinity and passion for it. So we think that that is very important for the foundation. The other thing, which is, I think, the most important, especially as they go into marketing classes, is understanding the philosophy of beauty and how that has changed and how that is culturally different and how we perceive beauty. Like what's beautiful to me is different than what's beautiful to you. And there's a reason for that. And so we dig into the psychology of beauty. And then from there, I think that really gives them a foundation to be really strong marketers in the industry. I love that this course exists. And I almost feel like everyone in the industry needs to take it. That's already in the industry. It's hard because there's just not a lot of information out there. And, you know, I think SCAD has done a really great job of kind of pulling from all of these places. But we also bring in guest speakers. You know, we had David Yee come to our class, who's just recently wrote a book on like men's beauty and the history of men's beauty. And that's something we really don't talk about. And so that's been great to incorporate into the class. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. What do you want students or anybody college age, young, professional, interested in the beauty industry to know that you didn't know? There are two things. And the first, my message is to high school students. And there are resources out there now uh, that weren't available when I was coming out of undergrad to help you get into this career and to get into the beauty industry. It's fairly difficult. And SCAD was actually started as a request from the industry, from L'Oreal in particular, on bringing junior level talent with industry knowledge. And so they helped us build our curriculum. And now this program, you know, starting off with six, we have over 100 students in the major now. So we are super excited about that. And we've seen so much interest from industry. So students that are in high school who want an option other than cosmetology or want to become an executive of a brand or even an entrepreneur, they can now take this program and get a really intensive education on how to be successful. We have the first graduating class coming out in the spring with their senior shows where they will present their own brands, the physical liquid, the package, the whole branding and the marketing. And it's just truly amazing, mind blown, because I've never even thought about concepts that these students are bringing forth. And so it's super impressive. So now you have an option to go into the industry. So it's great. The second thing I would say, once you are in your career, remember that jobs are not destinations and it is truly a journey. Don't let money drive your decision or you will be led into a dead end. And I think, you know, people who have that in their head, like I need to be a millionaire before I'm 40, that type of thing, you'll find yourself in a very awkward situation professionally. I think that there are times where we have to take horizontal moves just to, again, fill our tool pack and then get the skills necessary to be great at that higher level. So just be open to exploring new things and new opportunities. I love that tip about being open to the horizontal move because we don't hear that enough. And often if you get a lateral move opportunity, you're thinking that it's somehow less than where it could offer, as you're saying, more skills for your toolkit and actually open up your world in lots of other ways to prepare you for the next thing. Everything is preparation. Absolutely. It is preparation. And I'll give you an example in my career at Lauder. I was in global marketing for quite a while at the manager level. And instead of being promoted up, I was given an opportunity to spend a month in Asia, you know, which to me, if you look at it from a salary perspective, the investment of the company Uh, to give me that education versus how much they would have paid me for the promotion, it can mean more. And they can never take away that experience, never take away that education. So I think being open to other opportunities is important. I'm excited to hear that L'Oreal helped to build this program because internships are such a key to success, in my opinion. 
and having the program connecting to the industry as it is makes it easier to facilitate some internships. So how important are internships to the program and to students in general, in your opinion? You know, I think internships are super important. I think it really differentiates a student coming out of college. Many times, even the most junior roles in beauty require one to two years. The great thing about SCAD, our classes are set up in such a way, it's almost like doing an internship. So there's probably, you know, lecture in the beginning, but most of the class we spend working. And students are very, very engaged and active in real world problems. However, that being said, you know, we had 100% internships for our seniors. And um, we've had so many internships for our juniors as well. So they have been on it and even taking classes and doing internships. So they're really, really active. And I think it really makes them stand out and it makes them stand apart because they're getting that professional maturity as well as they start to work in their internships. I think that's critically important. How do you think COVID and just all the things that are happening now, COVID, the social justice movement, all the things that are impacting the industry, what impact do you think they have on the industry? And what do your students, like your graduating seniors, need to know? Or anybody graduating or entering the field now needs to know? This year, I think everyone can agree, has been (laughs) a challenge. And there's so much going on. But as we look at COVID and its effect on job opportunities, I think that we haven't seen so much of that because our students have been receiving a lot of internships and paid. And so I think we haven't seen so much of it from an opportunity standpoint. And I think the beauty industry is very resilient and will come back. I think there are bigger implications for some of the social justice conversations that are happening. And for students coming out, coming into an industry where underrepresented minorities skew higher from a consumer base. But once we look inside the companies, we don't see that necessarily reflected. I think there may be concern from some students, but I do want to say this. I have been just amazed and encouraged by the initiatives that I see coming from the industry. This has been a discussion long before what we've seen this year, whether it's through product, whether it's through employment, but I really see some progressive change happening in the beauty industry as far as recruitment is concerned. So I think that's very promising. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I really am a big advocate for equity in the industry. And one of the things I think about the shift that's happening and the changes is that it has to be a long-term goal as opposed to an immediate, like, let's change it right now and then go on to the next. This is something that is progressing as we grow. It changes, it evolves, and we can't go back to what we were. We just have to keep moving forward. And that's why I like this generation, because they hold you accountable. So I don't think these companies will have a choice. Yeah, that is probably the key difference in terms of, let's talk about product for a minute. We've seen companies embrace the multicultural consumer before. We've seen that. And we've also seen it go away. Yes. But since consumers have had a voice and outlets for that voice, it would be very difficult for beauty brands and companies to pull back on initiatives because consumers want to be served and they want to see themselves and products that represent their needs. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you about it and hold you accountable for your actions. Absolutely. What is the unsung skill you need to succeed in the beauty industry? I think you need a thick skin for sure. (laughs) Resiliency. I think resiliency and I think listening is very important and not listening to what people say or listening to the information or listening to the consumer necessarily, but watch what's happening around you. I think that that is the most important thing and think about what's coming next. If you can listen, learn, identify what's coming next, be resilient through the downtimes and pull yourself back up, I think you can have a long career in beauty. Now, how do you identify top talent to add to a team? So when I look at talent that I've hired on my teams, I'm less concerned about 
years of experience in a place or technical skills or things like that. Like I can teach you to do the job. There are other things that I can't teach and I can't teach someone to have empathy for others and I can't teach them how to be resilient. I can't teach them collaboration skills. I think that the softer skills are things that I look for more. And I think that's what keeps those, especially those entry-level employees there longer. Also, I think it's important as well that you continue to learn all the time. And that just because you're doing well, that you don't stop there, that you're continually bettering yourself and improving your skill sets. So if I can see evidence of that, I really enjoy watching or interviewing people or hiring talent that can prove that. I think that's great. The idea of always learning. I mean, that's a lifelong pursuit as opposed to you get to a point and you're done, especially because we're in such a technological world. Overall, it just behooves us to just keep learning and be open to all new things that come our way, especially if we're talking about professionally open to the things that are driving change. Yes. You've gone from fashion to toys, to spirits, to beauty, to academia. When do you know when it's time to make a career shift? Because you've made some. Yes. And I think, you know, when you're no longer adding value. And going back to what we were talking about before about, you know, what I look for, looking, listening, watching what's happening around you and seeing what's coming is so very important. And I did that with Toys R Us and I did that with Liz Claiborne. Both of those companies were at its peak when I left. Claiborne, of course, doesn't exist in the same way. Toys R Us doesn't exist. Um, I think they've transitioned to a VC firm of some sort, but it's very important to watch other than your kind of immediate team and just have a broader view and a broader um, perspective. So super, super important. And when you're no longer adding value in a role, you should look for opportunities as well. I never want to leave a team and that entire team fall because I've left. That's not good leadership. And that's not something that anyone should aim to do. However, you should be bringing up your team around you, building that team so that it's functional with or without you. However, with you, if you find two years, three years, four years down the road that you're really not growing, whether it's the team or growing yourself, then it is time to move. And so I've tried to keep that in mind each and every time, knowing that academia was my end goal. And I've been pretty successful at that. I've been really happy with the roles that I've had and the companies that I've been with. And I love that you said you do not want to see a team fall after you leave. Sometimes in our fantasies, we're like, oh, you're going to be nothing without me. But in actuality, you do not want to see your work be diminished by your absence. The work that you've put in place, the changes that you've helped to create for a company, you don't really want to see them, you know. Yeah. And to be honest, it's a bad reflection on you because what type of leader are you that you built a team that can't survive without you? That's not good leadership. And so if I saw that and I was applying to another company, that isn't somebody I would want to hire. So that's how I look at that. Now let's move on to our fast track questions. What was the first beauty product you ever tried or bought? The first one is hair, right? So, you know, I won't tell my age, but that was the beginning where we started doing relaxers and all of that. And I remember pink oil lotion being the thing to have. And I think when I finally got my little allowance, that was kind of one thing that I purchased to do upkeep with my hair. It's so interesting to think about hair now and the journey of African-American hair today versus back then. So yeah, I think pink oil lotion. Yeah. Shout out to Luster because pink oil lotion is a classic. It is a classic in the black community and among textured hair in general. It is a classic. What is the most recent product you've tried? There's two. I have my products that I have here during my classes over Zoom, but I would say um, I got the Tatcha water cream, which I've been using, which I really like. And then this RMS Beauty. It's called a lip to cheek uh, that I really like. And so I love RMS because it's like clean beauty and I don't have like the allergic reaction. But yeah, I've been using these two. Great. 
If you had to give up a type, a category of beauty, what would you give up a type of product? I'm definitely a skincare girl. So I think I could do without eyeliner. I never use eyeliner because I'm always like rubbing my eyes or something. And, you know, I look like a raccoon by the end of the day. So (laughs) I think I could give that up. What's the beauty advice you live by or leave alone? Live by, don't touch your face. Keep your hair out of your face. And that's how you get good skin. Is there anything you leave alone? I would say anything that I leave alone. I don't do a lot of these kind of uh, alternative beauty um, things where it's like peels your entire face. You know, it's so interesting teaching this younger generation because they are berated. They try so many different products and they have like peels and scrubs. And some of these are a little scary to me. And we don't have the regulations that we should in the U.S. So I'm always concerned that something is going to happen. So I try to stay away from some of those things until I see they're proven. I can understand that. But I'm, I'm a junkie. I'll try stuff. <laughs> What was the best career advice you received and what was it? Completely know this one. This one would be no matter what role you have, find a gap, fill it, and become an expert in it. Oh, I love that. I love that. And finally, what was the most memorable mentorship experience, either as a mentor or mentee, that you had? I had so many mentors in my life. I have been so lucky. But What I'll say right now in my life, I think my biggest mentor are my students by far. Um, I think I've seen a very big change in myself and my capabilities in the last two years. You know, my perspective has completely changed. And besides learning fun things like TikTok and social media and video editing that I've learned from my students, you know, I think they've taught me how to be brave. Like, I just love this new culture that they're bringing forward holding everyone accountable for everything they believe in, demanding change. They're always learning new things. I don't necessarily have to teach my students everything technically. They will go on YouTube, LinkedIn Learning, and learn anything they need to make their work the best. And so I just love that attitude that they have, and they've really kind of imparted that on me. So the kids at SCAD are just amazing. So I would say they have been my biggest mentor. Great. This has been an amazing conversation. I have so enjoyed it. I'm so glad that there's so many young people that are interested in the industry and that it's growing and that the conversation is continuing. So thank you so much for having me on here. It's been really, really cool. Well, that's our show for today. Join our Facebook group, the Start Right Here Facebook group, and also subscribe to the newsletter too, folks. That's our show for today. Remember that there's more than one way to the top and the most important step is the first one. So start right here.